welcome back after this short break to ARIC 2021 conference, Rankings and Internationalization of Higher Education. This is the topic of the final session of our conference. And I'm, and I'm uh, happy to welcome Laura Rambley, Associate Director of EAIE. Laura, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Julia. Welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. I'm delighted to be part of this session today. Shall I begin, Julia? Sure, yeah, you're welcome. The floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, it's a delight to be a part of with a wonderful array of colleagues. It would, of course, have been fantastic for us to all physically be together. In but nonetheless, this is a very exciting opportunity to come together and cover some very interesting topics in this sixth session in the program on the subject of rankings and international. My name is Laura Rumbley, and as Julia mentioned, I'm the Associate Director for Knowledge Development and Research at the European Association for International Education. I'm joined today by an outstanding uh, panel uh, group who will be walking with me through what we hope will be a very dynamic and interesting conversation about rankings and internationalization. I'd like to begin, therefore, with a bit of an introduction of who those individuals are. First uh, on the list here, I'd like to present Dr. Fernando Leon Garcia, President of the International Association of University Presidents, or IAUP, for the period 2021 to 2024. He's also been President of CETIS University since 2020, leading that institution to accreditation and really uh, helping it uh, advance to one of the most internationalized universities in Mexico. He's also previously been Chancellor of the City University of Seattle's International Division, serves on a variety of international boards and advisory councils, um, and it really brings a, a very important um, institutional and global perspective to our conversation today. Good morning to you, Fernando. I know it's early for you where you are. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Honored to be with this uh, distinctive group. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to present Gerardo Blanco, uh, who I understand really is a scholar practitioner at heart. He's held an array of professional roles in colleges and universities in his country of birth, Mexico, as well as in the United States, ranging from quality assurance and assessment to residential education and global learning. He has wide international experience as a former Fulbright specialist, a visiting scholar in China, Germany and Poland, and as an, uh, an advisor to the government of Pakistan. Currently, he is the academic director at the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College in the United States, where he's really active exploring the intersection between quality and internationalization in higher education, with a particular commitment to global social justice issues and curiosity for the ways that higher education institutions define, improve, and communicate their value to different stakeholder groups, which I think is quite in alignment with the theme of this conference on the effects of rankings on community and society. Gerardo, it's lovely to see you today. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. Really delighted to be part of the, of the panel. Great to see you. I don't see on camera, but I know to be here, Daniela Crecion, who is a researcher at the Center for Higher Education Policy Studies, or CHEPS, at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. She holds a, a PhD in political science from the Central European University. Um, in, and her research uh, at the dissertation level analyzed national higher education international strategies from around the world. She's a previous lecturer at Bard College Ber Berlin, a tutor and academic advisor for Olive Refugee Education Initiatives, and was a visiting scholar or teaching, um, held a teaching role at the University of Yangon in Myanmar, the Federal University of Sao Carlos in Brazil, and indeed the, the Boston College Center for International Higher Education. Hi there, Daniela, I do see you now. Hi, sorry, apparently the technical problems did happen. <laughs> <laughs> there, we wouldn't be an online conference without one or two of those. Um, great that you're with us. And last but certainly not least, my very dear friend and colleague Hans de Witt is with us. I feel you need very little introduction in this context, but I'll say a few words anyway. You are the former director and distinguished fellow of the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College. A bit of a thread here, starting to sound like a, a, a bit of a mafia. Um, founding director of the Journal of Studies in International Education, 
former president and uh, founding member of the EAIE, where I now serve. Um, and interestingly, um, really one of the founding fathers of the field of internationalization in higher education. And I know your current research is always involving um, looking now at how we can provide global learning for all students, the future of internationalization post COVID-19 and international student recruitment and mobility in non-Anglophone countries being a part of your agenda at the moment. It's fantastic to see you here, Hans. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Laura, and uh, great to be part of this uh, great panel. Uh, all indeed uh, close uh, friends and colleagues, uh, and happy to have uh, also Fernando being with us again, and Daniela, who uh, is there. And ironically, although Laura, Daniela, and I are based in Amsterdam, uh, Laura and I are now in the United States, so uh, <laughs> it's uh, really international. And I'm even back to back in the offices with Gerardo these days. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to the conversation. Wonderful. It is fun. It's hard to keep up with us, uh, even in these times of travel restrictions. Great yeah. to be with you. So we have a nice bit of time here to cover a range of topics. We as a group have had some thoughts about ways that we could dip a toe into this very complex question of rankings and internationalization. But I would very much like to encourage our international audience with lots of different perspectives and expertise as well. Uh, send along questions or comments that you'd like for us to uh, weave into the conversation because that will absolutely enrich uh, the time that we have here together. Uh, but to get us started, I thought I would um, kick things off with a, a bit of a game, a word game, as it were. Um, I had asked each of you as, as individuals, as experts, to reflect, if you could, on a single word or phrase that captures your general feelings about this topic of rankings and internationalization. Kind of a tricky exercise, but one that I thought might give us a little bit of a, a sense of the temperature in the room around those, those feelings and, and those considerations um, about this topic. So I thought I would turn first to Fernando and ask if you might volunteer that word or phrase and give us some indication of, of why that springs to mind for you. Sure, thank you. And uh, I'd like to thank, thank you for facilitating the session and uh, congratulations to Luis Claudio for putting up another excellent event. But I think that um, when we listen to this, we, in my case at least, it's uh, necessary but biased. Any institution that is seriously committed to quality will eventually be linked to rankings. And any serious internationalization effort has to focus on quality. Both are intertwined, but the focus of rankings has been on research, while internationalization has been from a developed country perspective. There is some progress with efforts such as the THE impact rankings, the incorporation of SDGs. Still missing is internationalization from a developing world perspective. Universities from these regions are not senders to develop countries are net senders to developed countries and or are engaged in internationalization efforts at home and the rankings do not recognize this at all. That said, when paired, they do create a positive synergy that helps universities overall improve and bring them closer to the rest of the world. Thank, th thank you, those would be my brief introductory remarks so that we can have a lot more time <laughs> to delve into the topic. <laughs> Absolutely. There's so much to unpack there. Great. So let's let that uh, percolate in people's minds. And I'll turn next to Daniela, if I may. Uh, what can you tell us about your word or, or initial thought about this topic? Uh, yeah, thanks so much. Um, my uh, term was questionable uh, and why. Um, this rankings more generally and what they measure when it comes to internationalization more specifically do not in my view, capture quality in higher education, which is what they are generally used as a proxy for by institutional leaders and policymakers and even students and staff. I believe that what they do capture is what uh, Ellen Hazelcorn calls historical competitive advantage for those universities included in the rankings and historical competitive disadvantage for those that are not in those rankings. Um, rankings have been promoted as an accountability and transparency policy instrument 
like quality assurance and accreditation systems. Um, rankings are meant to provide valid, reliable, and globally comparable information on the quality and performance of higher education institutions. But at best, they capture a limited view of quality. Quality is a zero-sum game. Quality is a club good uh, to which only a selected few can aspire to. Um, and even a more limited view on internationalization. Internationalization is strictly mobility. Um, is. This is the aspect that is measured in these rankings most of the times. So they promote this rhetoric of rising and meritocracy. Uh, suggesting that opportunities are truly equal for all institutions to be part of this club, uh, that they will rise in these rankings if they work hard at it, um, if they have a strategy to achieve this goal, and um, that they will be rewarded for their uh, hard work by raising in the rankings. Um, and this is uh, very similar to what Michael Sandel calls the tyranny of merit, uh, this idea that you can really make it if you try very hard, uh, but uh, it ignores the pervasive unfairness uh, within and between our societies. Um, so that is why I believe that rankings and internationalization with this persistent focus on mobility say something about the competitive advantage that countries and universities have accumulated over time due to historical, geopolitical and economic dynamics and conditions um, such as resource disparity or colonial. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. In really just a very short period of time, you, you hit on some very profound and important notions. Fernando also brought up this no notion of quality, the, que the issue of representativeness. Um, you're weaving in now these questions of historical advantage and disadvantage, and the idea of false meritocracy um, undergirding some of these uh, dynamics with rankings and internationalization. So many things for us to chew on. And again, I would really encourage our audience to react to some of these things and chime in, you know, in, um, in thinking through some of these dynamics. Hans, can I turn to you now with your word or phrase? Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, of course, yeah, quality is essential as uh, has been said before. Uh, I would call it a very unfortunate alliance or even not an alliance, but an, uh, for, uh, an, an unfortunate forced marriage between uh, rankings and internationalization. Uh, uh, it's ironic that although more and more rankings are global or at least regional, uh, and so they have an international impact, but they don't address really internationalization. They address quantitative uh, uh, and even that not even reliable data on number of international students, number of international scholars, number of co-publication with international orders. Uh, but that is not really what internationalization is about. about. Uh, and so uh, we cannot uh, use rankings um, to really have an internationalization policy ranked. Uh, we can uh, use quality assurance to improve the contribution that internationalization makes to the overall quality of uh, uh, higher education. Uh, but that's a qualitative way, as has been said before, and rankings um, don't measure that. So even although rankings are only addressing a very small percentage uh, of the higher education uh, 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 environment, uh, something like uh, 2,000 out of over 40,000 institutions of higher education, so by that it is not representative, but even for those that are into the rankings, uh, it is not really addressing uh, what internationalization is about. So the combination to assume that uh, rankings are addressing internationalization and even there are like Times Higher Education uh, having rankings that are defining what is the most international university there is. This is an absurd uh, relationship which is not really uh, justifiable in any case. Thank you. Great, Hans. So ever provocative, the notion of a forced marriage, you know, between rankings and internationalization, a very uncomfortable dynamic. Um, sort of this tyranny of data, tyranny of numbers that we need to be careful about. And really uh, this idea of fundamentally missing the mark on internationalization by having to rely on these indicators that really don't get at the essence and complexity of what this thing uh, that international, internationalization is. So again, a lot of very important ideas for us to think about. Gerardo, you're up with a word or a phrase and, and why it's at the top of mind for you. 
Certainly. Well, there is very little to add to uh, these contributions. Uh, from my perspective, the word I would use is conflicted, because indeed there is a tension. I think this idea of, uh, in a way, a marriage of convenience captures uh, really well the tension that exists between internationalization, um, of course, and rankings. And the piece that I would like to follow, right, the thread that I would like to pull in this case is the notion of uh, academic leaders and uh, practitioners of internationalization. Because for the longest time in this, uh, uh, in a way, um, uh, pressure, Right for climbing up the ranking uh, ladder. Uh, very often it has been emphasized that internationalization is one of those areas um, that uh, colleagues around the world can control. Of course, as Hans has clarified, internationalization in this sense is understood in an extremely narrow sense, primarily limited to mobility. But that's one of the things that universities, particularly in the global south, have been focusing on. This notion of we need to attract more foreign faculty, we need to attract more international students so that we uh, kind of improve those metrics. We know, of course, that that the measure of internationalization in most ranking methodologies is insignificant when compared to reputation, first and foremost, and research, secondly. So in a way, there are tensions here. And, and why I feel conflicted about it is that in some ways, I have given up on recommending colleagues that um, not to pay attention to rankings. I think that sale has shipped. We all pay attention to rankings, even if we disagree with them. So I suppose what we need um, to do going forward is to engage with rankings in a critical way, but also with a fresh look, trying to look for different ways to be part of the system uh, with our eyes wide open, recognizing that the system is not um, just rewarding merit, but rather uh, rewarding, as Daniela indicated, um, that um, cumulative advantage by some, some universities and some countries as well. Great. Thank you so much, Gerardo, and to all of you for these wonderful foundational ideas. We started out talking in big generalities, you know, about this notion of uh, rankings and engagement with with internationalization. And I'd like to start drilling down a little more specifically into some very um, particular um, I have you to think in advance about a country, a region of the know quite quite close to, and to puzzle over a bit the way that you feel that rankings in internationalism are playing out in a particular context. What's notable in your mind about how the rational dynamic is playing out. If we consider this sequence of the theme for this conference, which is, of course, the effects of rankings on community and society. So to get at this question, I turn first to Danielle. See if you could talk considerations about that national or regional reality that you see. Um, thank you. Yeah, we, we all know and touched upon this um, in our uh, introductory comments that uh, rankings are dominated by developed countries and more specifically by Anglo-Saxon nations. In uh, 2020, four countries, the UK, US, Australia and Canada had 60 institutions in the top 100 of the Shanghai rankings. Um, and we see more diversification happening uh, with different iterations of these rankings as a result of changing methodologies and really huge Herculean efforts by very many countries and institutions to be included in these um, rankings and playing the rankings games, like uh, how you, Laura, suggested at one point is the rankings Olympics. Um, nevertheless, the region where I come from, Central and Eastern uh, Europe, I come from Romania, um, is not uh, featured prominently in rankings, if at all. Um, Around uh, 2010, when these rankings uh, started to get a lot of traction, countries in Central and Eastern Europe suffered the rankings shock. Uh, in other words, this realization that universities from these world regions were not doing well at all uh, in rankings, and that many C uh, Central Eastern European countries did not even have one institution in the top 100, uh, 500. Um, and many, including Romania, um, 
as I said, my country of origin still don't. Um, and uh, this is still a shock, but there, it has led to a big uh, government push uh, for internationalization, as this was a way of seen um, also as a way of climbing in the rankings. Um, and I will talk a bit about uh, um, internationalization um, and rankings in the context of uh, Romania and uh, Portugal, as Laura asked me to reflect a bit uh, on this in preparation for this panel um, and why these two countries. Uh, Ligia Deca characterizes them as both of the semi-periphery of internationalization efforts in the university sector um, and that they face similar pushes to internationalize, uh, such as resource scarcity, uh, decreasing public investment in higher education, uh, pronounced uh, democrat uh, demographic downturn, and um, pronounced regional divide between uh, rural and urban areas in the case of Romania and uh, coastal and inland areas in the case of Portugal. Um, but they have both adopted this kind of uh, market-driven model of internationalization in higher education, with both Romania and Poland striving for more international fee-paying students and for a better place in international rankings. Um, and overall, we can see policy mimicry happening in these countries as they try to imitate Anglo-Saxon internationalization tactics, uh, push pursuing internationalization at the national level, mainly for economic reasons rather than societal or academic reasons. And um, in my view, this is quite short-sighted. Um, even if we assume that this is desirable, um, by definition, not all countries can rise so fast in international rankings and not everyone can use the tactics of Anglo-Saxon countries. Um, the historical competitive which I mentioned earlier comes into play here. Um, for instance, countries with strong existing ties to Southeast Asia would do better in attracting um, students from that region than systems that are just starting to target uh, that market um, because they see it as an economic opportunity. Uh, in Romania and Portugal, a large number of international students come via the language route uh, from countries that speak Romanian or uh, Portuguese, uh, respectively. So for Romania, many students, uh, international students come from Moldova and from Portugal, they come from the Lusophone area. And, and we see that language proficiency and foreign policy are still play a significant role in higher education internationalization, even when it comes to, to mobility, or especially when it comes to mobility. And if we give up this restricted view of internationalization as mobility, which has been thoroughly criticized for not being inclusive and rightly, this one size, one size fits all uh, type of market-driven internationalization uh, makes even less sense for this context. Uh, countries such as Romania and Portugal would do better in focusing on um, internationalization at home rather than internationalization abroad. And research has repeatedly shown that cooperation rather than uh, competition can lead to a lot of benefits for students, institutions, um, and staff. So not following the demands of rankings and engaging in uh, competition can still um, lead to benefits um, for all of these levels. Um, in a study I did for the European Commission with Kata Oros, where we looked at a systematic, we did a systematic literature review of the benefits of cooperation between higher education institutions. And we found that at the national level, you can see more and better patents, you can see uh, economies of scale, you can see positive attitudes developing towards open borders and democracy. Um, at the institutional level, you see benefits such as strengthened research and teaching capacity, more and better scientific output, attractiveness to foreign academics. Um, and at the individual level, um, students have a higher likelihood of employment at home and abroad. Um, they have better foreign language proficiency. They have uh, increased mobility as well, uh, not just for studying, but also for work and academic staff, it can lead to more and better publications. Uh, cooperation, of course, also has challenges, uh, like having to build symmetric relationships between the partners uh, and negotiating different viewpoints. But I really believe that these are challenges that are worth taking on that, and that would uh, lead to a better quality of our higher education systems and institutions. Thank you. 
Great, Daniela. And I think it's actually really fascinating that we began with an example within Europe, which we often consider to be quite at the center of the uh, you know, global action when it comes to rankings and internationalization. But even within that context, there are these peripheral, peripheral realities with very unique challenges and um, um, strategies that they seem to be pursu pursuing for better or worse, depending on, on your perspective on these things. So really an excellent example of, of these uh, particular dynamics. Fernando, in your opening comments, you mentioned very specifically this concern around a lack of representation from the developing world. Um, I'd love to give uh, you the floor now to talk a bit about a regional or national context that occurs to you. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Mexico and Latin America in general. While the number of institutions in Mexico that participate in rankings is still relatively small, there is an upward trend. And as both uh, Times Higher Education and QS have incorporated other criteria or variation of existing criteria, for example, uh, THE impact rankings or QS stars, more institutions are willingly and in a more deliberate and planned manner participating in ranking efforts. Uh, there is still room for growth and improvement, of course. Uh, let's remember that if we're talking about quality and positioning, rankings can be an instrument but then there's another one that's called institutional accreditation. I know that it is not necessarily present in all the continents, but as we look at what is done in the US and as some of us aspire to be there and commensurate with what's there as a, as a proxy for quality, institutional accreditation in the US is another way of uh, doing that. So for example, outside of the US, Mexico has perhaps the most robust institutional accreditation effort across Latin America. But the rankings do not take this into account. Even though from a quality perspective, it is already a robust effort. It's been in existence for uh, about 30 years already. And uh, the, the uh, organization is FIMPES, Mexican Federation of Private Universities. Within the country, there's an effort to try to push towards uh, greater accountability and greater quality. There's a national effort right now that is in the process of being implemented. And in a parallel fashion with respect to internationalization, a new breed of internationalization or variation of it is being worked on right now. So that the focus of course is uh, a more global and diverse preparation and perspective that students can engage in, but to do so mindful of intercultural and inclusive matters. Other countries such as Colombia are also moving forward and fast th in this arena. And the recent emergence of uh, Real Cup or Real Cup, that's how, we, uh, that's how you would write it, is also likely to contribute. This is uh, a meta accreditation effort across Latin America. By the way, there are only currently about a dozen institutions in Latin America that are accredited in the US and perhaps about 50 from around the world with the same label. Each and every one of these cases are systematic efforts aimed at quality improvement, and in the process involves taking the recognition of quality to an international or global level. This is an achievement and accomplishment that neither THE or QS value sufficiently in their ranking criteria. And mind you, this is grounded in quality, student success, the professoria, teaching, et cetera. While what we do and why we are here does involve the generation of knowledge, as is stressed by the rankings, let's all remember that our mission is to prepare our students for a meaningful role in society and economic activities. Rankings and internationalization are supposed to be the result on the one hand and an enabler on the other hand of what should be the preparation of well-rounded persons and professionals. And if we are aligned with that thought, ranking organizations have to be mindful and do more beyond the thousand or so institutions, as uh, uh, Hans reminds us, of the thousands and thousands that exist in the world. Thank you. No, and I think you know that reminder of the the central core issue of quality and the um, really the much more expansive and nuanced 
um, process that seems to be embedded in accreditation versus most of the ranking exercises that, that we're aware of. Um, so I think a lot for us to think about as we move forward in this conversation. Uh, Hans, I'd like to turn to you now with your national or regional perspective. Yeah, thank you. And I, I was uh, struggling to see what I uh, would take as a regional perspective because I could take the United States, I could take uh, uh, my own country, the Netherlands, or I could take broader uh, Europe. Uh, the interesting thing, of course, in the U.S. is that uh, besides the national ranking, the international rankings in general are less uh, looked at um, uh, because there's the assumption, well, we are the best anyway, which uh, is a question of perception more than reality, but uh, that's uh, a, a fact. So the U.S. as a case study is maybe not so important because uh, it's not paying so much attention to the global rankings as elsewhere. Uh, if you look at Europe, I will take two cases. One is a Dutch case, the University of Maastricht as an example. Uh, uh, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, Times Higher Education has been also uh, doing a ranking uh, on what are the more international, most international universities. And uh, it's interesting that a university like Maastricht is coming up very high there together with universities in Switzerland and universities in, uh, in Qatar, for instance. And, uh, and of course, these are all universities that are surrounded by a lot of frontiers. And by that, by nature, have uh, if you take the indicators of uh, the rankings, are very international because they have a lot of students who cross border. They have a lot of faculty who cross border. And uh, by that, they do pretty well. But it doesn't say anything about how internationalized they are. So that's a, a subtle difference we have to make. First of all, you can question if a university is very international when it has predominantly, uh, it's based in the Netherlands, has predominantly German students as the international students, a little bit of Belgium and then from elsewhere. Uh, and the same could be said about uh, universities in Switzerland and, and in Qatar. Uh, so there you see already how um, questionable the whole criteria is. And that's sad because a university like the University of Maastricht is really also have a very, very strong internationalization policy. So they are, judged uh, for the wrong reasons. They should be judged for the quality of the internationalization strategy and not for the quantitative indicators that the rankings use. That's one simple example which makes clear how uh, complicated the whole uh, relationship is between internationalization and rankings. The more important part, and I've been working on it in, in Russia, Russia uh, where you see how rankings really uh, influence negatively the policy of internationalization. Uh, in the 5100 project and also in the new project that uh, they are doing, uh, internationalization is perceived uh, as being, uh, we have to increase the number again of international students and the number of international scholars and co-publications because that's what the rankings want. And we want to have five institutions in the top hundreds of the international rankings. That was the original idea behind it. So what do universities then do? Uh, they get money from the government, which is very nice to improve their quality and by that their, their, uh, their, their position in the rankings. But it turns the things upside down because the rankings are driving the policy and not the policy is resulting into a higher position in the rankings. So they start to say, well, we have to recruit international students. We have to recruit international faculty. And, uh, but they don't have the quality infrastructure and the quality... Uh, capacity of, for instance, uh, language uh, teaching um, to, to make that happen. So what you get then is that you have international students that are separately taught by, uh, by faculty from abroad, and then there are local students who are taught by local faculty in their own language. So there's no integration, there's no interaction going on. So that is a very dangerous development. Uh, you have to work the other way around and that is what we learn from this kind of uh, uh, national policies of excellence, which are focused so much on we have to move up in the rankings as driving instead of the rankings have to be a result of a quality input into higher education. Uh, and in that, it's always also surprising that in, in countries like in Central Eastern Europe, Russia, uh, but also Latin America, it is the QS ranking which is perceived as being much more important than the 
uh, ARU rankings or the Times Higher Education rankings or the Leiden rankings, which to a certain extent have a better focus on quality than on perceptions of, uh, of, of uh, reputation. Uh, and also uh, those rankings are much more related to, uh, to uh, programs of quality approval done by the, the QS ranking. And I think we have to also be aware that these are mainly industries. And so they have a different interest than the higher education sector has itself. And we have to be careful about doing that. And that's what I have seen in Russia, but I unfortunately see it also in other parts of the world, in particular, as Fernando has mentioned, the, the challenges that uh, are there in Latin America, uh, we see it in Africa, that uh, there is not uh, an own quality incentive as the basis for improvement of higher education, but it is the rankings that have to drive the agenda also, and in particular on the internationalization side. So that uh, there are just some examples to see, well, why I think it's a very unhappy and forced marriage. Thank you. Thank, I think yeah, you really, really made very clear the dangers associated with the oversimplification of these, uh, the understanding of these complex phenomena that have to do with internationalization, and also the um, kind of the manic behavior, the chasing of one's tail, as or as a you know a, as national policy, in trying to get at uh, some sort of goal um, without really considering the um, the many complex components of what what that goal means and what the process of getting there could be like in a more ideal world. Um, over to you now with a, a regional example that springs to mind for you. Uh, sorry, I, I just the connection had skipped uh, the sound. Uh, so happy to jump in here. Um, I, like Hans, also struggled to identify an area to focus, but I really thought uh, for the sake of our conversation, it would be available to uh, focus primarily in North America, specifically uh, the United States and Canada. Well, not my uh, region of origin, a place that I've researched and, and where I've been living. Uh, and I think one of the areas that really um, is worth mentioning here, especially given the different points that have been shared uh, in this panel, is uh, it it's an important reminder that the vast majority of universities in the United States and Canada are not top ranked universities and that the vast majority of students in uh, these two countries and in the region of North America do not attend uh, higher education institutions um, that are top ranked around the world. And I think this is an important reminder because very often we talk about higher education systems in terms of monoliths. Um, and especially when we have conversations about rankings uh, and more broadly when we have conversations about quality, the challenge is really separating the everyday lived experiences um, that take place in these higher education institutions and a set of perceptions that very often are either very delayed, right? In a way, it's very, it takes a very long time to build a reputation, good or bad, um, at the same time. Um, very often, uh, there are cultural misunderstandings, uh, information can be inaccurate, there isn't precision, and so on. So I think here, it's very important to remember, right? precisely why the conversation about rankings has to be critical as it relates to internationalization. In a way, um, while one might expect that um, higher education institutions in Canada and in the United States, um, the conversation about internationalization should be very different than some of the regions that we have been discussing in this panel. They are not, right? In reality, uh, mobility continues to be a very uh, small uh, reality, uh, a very elitist approach to internationalization at the same time, uh, similar to the example, uh, perhaps not as extreme, uh, that Hans was sharing about Russia. We see that there is a significant level of segregation of international students in the United States, right? That in many ways, um, there, the systems Right, while there is a significant number that has declined in the past year, of course, due to COVID, of international students, um, 
higher education institutions in the United States are not fully taking advantage of opportunities for internationalization at home. So in a way, uh, these different regions we are discussing have a lot more in common in terms of the challenges than um, they have in differences based on the uh, maybe privileges, uh, some earned and some unearned, that the rankings uh, have afforded to certain higher education systems. And I think my last thought in this round would be to really emphasize the missed opportunity about new approaches to internationalization. Um, I think while it is too early and, um, to, to rush into judgments, what is really happening is that um, many higher education institutions are missing the opportunity to think deeply about new approaches of internationalization. Uh, and this is at least in part because rankings do not reward um, any of these mechanisms, right? So some of the most exciting um, approaches to internationalization, such as uh, virtual exchange uh, and, and other approaches that really have the potential to contribute to internationalizing the curriculum, um, they don't have a mechanism to be captured in rankings. So I'm, I'm, I'm truly afraid that um, some of these innovations have a very high risk of kind of fading um, into the background. And that would be a very important uh, and, and sadly, uh, a very significant missed opportunity uh, if we don't find a way to at least um, considering some of those opportunities, perhaps around collaborative research and so on, to be captured in rankings. Gerardo, thank you for bringing all of those very important details up. Um, because of what you've just said, a couple of things occur. One is that I really do want I want to remind the audience attending our session, as you have considerations and thoughts, ideas that you'd like for us to follow up on, I hope you'll provide those in the chat box so that we're into our conversation. Um, we had here as a panel a plan of how we might proceed through a series of questions. I just suggest that I jump the queue a little bit, specifically because of what Gerardo has brought up, and turn to a question that I, I had asked all of you to think about, which has to do with this notion of inequity. So Her, uh, Gerardo has reminded us, you know, very clearly that uh, connections to the, the world's most highly ranked institutions, or ranked institutions for that matter, really is a privilege of a minority of students, minority of academics. Internationalization also is struggling phenomenon with this idea of equity. Uh, you've mentioned, Gerardo, the very you know, niche experience that may, may be equity, but there are also other dimensions of the internet experience that really are not um, globally enjoyed or um, accessed by institutions, academics, etc. So I'd like to turn to this question of, of inequity and have us as a group um, in the in of this conversation, you know, rankings are giving us a picture of the world where there's a hierarchy, you know, of profile and performance, which could be considered antithetical to agenda that we know is increasingly being discussed. How would each of you characterize the current realities or the future prospects for some kind of mutual reinforcement between equity focused internationalization and institutional rankings? Is that possible? Is that a, a total pipe? Um, how do we see those dynamics? Could I turn to you, Daniela, for a thought on this? Yeah, so I think uh, this discussion is very important and it's coming more and more in our discussions as academics uh, and also in our, my discussions with my students. We are uh, increasingly expected and our higher education institutions are increasingly expected to contribute to societal issues. Um, and internationalization and rankings uh, have been at the forefront also of, uh, of this discussion because um, of the issues you mentioned. Uh, are they promoting uh, inequity? Um, so we have seen many attempts from uh, rankings to actually take this discussion uh, on board and uh, include indicators that would measure societal issues that we care about, like the sustainable development goals or social inclusion in higher education of um, 
underrepresented populations or disadvantaged uh, students. Um, and aligned uh, with this policy uh, and social trends, um, I know the example of U MultiRank, which um, uh, CHEPS, the center where I work uh, at, also has a role in uh, developing. Uh, and they are uh, trying to introduce new indicators for social inclusion and sustainable development um, to measure what kind of uh, impact institutions are making in these areas. Um, and uh, as you can see, my university is making, uh, um, it's contributing to the uh, saving the environment by turning the lights on uh, off whenever I don't move. Um, yeah. Anyway, so uh, at UMultiRank, uh, they are looking at what indicators can be included to measure uh, sustainable development and to measure inclusion in higher education um, by looking at countries, uh, at institutions from uh, 97 different countries of the world, uh, 2,000 institutions, and trying to find what are valid, reliable, and comparable indicators uh, to look at, at these issues. Um, and in our research, uh, trying to find these indicators that are reliable, valid, and globally comparable. Uh, we have learned that um, contextualization of these indicators is very important when it comes to rankings, both when they are quantitative and uh, qualitative. So we need to provide users with the context of these uh, indicators and what they measure. And we have to communicate better uh, what are the limitations of these indicators. Also the rationale of why we collect this data and why we make these rankings or benchmarking tools matters a lot. So in an improvement oriented setting, it is much easier to take um, the context into account than if we make rankings about competition. So if we try to help universities with these rankings to say where they are um, and to improve uh, in the sense of actually trying to make a contribution to society, whether environmental or um, about inclusion, um, this is very important so that we don't make it about competition. Um, and it's also important to create communities of researchers, practitioners and users, uh, we think, because it helps to understand the challenges of these international comparisons and to broaden the scope of the interventions we are using in order to tackle these societal challenges that we have. Thank you so much. Great, Daniela, thank you so much. Um, Fernando, I'd like to come back to you with this question of equity-focused internationalization and institutional rankings. What, what kind of dynamics do you see there or possibilities? Well, I think that um, on the one hand, while, for example, accreditation doesn't necessarily uh, push the internationalization agenda, although it does uh, try to capture some, some sense of where the institutions happen to be, they are very strong in terms of what is referred to as JEDI, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. I think that uh, we need to learn from the pandemic and see what the pandemic has taught us. And I think that some basic things such as student development, student success, socio-emotional support are things that were not addressed appropriately before that as part of an accreditation effort or as part of rankings, we need to make sure that we measure that and that we incorporate that. I think that, again, the pandemic has only intensified the JEDI uh, agenda plus innovation, or what, what was it that it was referred to before? Disruptive innovation? I think we didn't ask for disruptive innovation, but the pandemic surely uh, pushed us very hard and made us pivot and adjust so I think that as we are moving forward, uh, there needs to be greater awareness about the need to embed SDGs. It doesn't have to be the 17, but whatever relevant ones an institution can deliberately incorporate into its agenda, make it part of its long range plan. One that I was uh, privy to be a part of the conversation just a few days ago, the COP or COP26 just ended in Glasgow. And we had a conversation led by Edward Peck from Nottingham Trent University on green internationalization. I'm sure Hans has a lot to say about that. But as we talk about internationalization, equity, et cetera, green internationalization is one that 
we should embrace, understand, and also see how it carries across in different settings. Because green internationalization can mean something and involve adjustments in developing countries, in developed countries, whereas it might mean something different in uh, developing countries. I think that the pandemic has also taught us that partnerships, virtual or e-mobility, I at H, that is internationalization at home, COIL related offerings, borderless professors, all of these are likely to impact what and how much we do in terms of internationalization. And to the extent that we get creative and deliberate and incorporate this into our agendas as leaders, then we will be able to move the, lead, the needle. Uh, more inclusion, more innovation, greater quality, if rankings are going to be reflective of the changing times, then they should recognize and incorporate internationalization and JEDI measures as part of the data they collect and use to determine institutional positioning in the future. Or what was it that they're supposed to measure quality? That too. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Fernando, for those insights. Um, Hans, indeed, you have written extensively about the equity dilemma or the concerns that you have um, about internationalization in a, in a highly unequal world. Um, how, how are you thinking these days about equity-focused internationalization and its possible in engagements with the global ranking dynamic? Yeah, thank you. And uh, I think... Uh, Daniela, Fernando, you have made great contributions to that uh, discussion. Uh, the point is that uh, we have to link all the, the, the essentials, so uh, green internationalization, equity, uh, the, what we call indeed broader internationalization for society or the social impact of, 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 uh, uh, of internationalization, uh, are all very essential parts uh, and uh, to make uh, internationalization more inclusive and at the same time much more so socially responsible uh, factors. So, uh, can rankings play a role in that? Uh, I think, again, we have to, uh, to make a difference between uh, rankings as being ranking and what Daniela correctly says, uh, we have to benchmark and we have to focus on quality assurance. If we focus much more on that, then on saying, well, what is the, uh, the position in the ranking, then uh, we benchmarking and comparison is, is a very important and relevant tool because we can learn from best and we can learn from bad practices. Uh, but unfortunately, rankings are not having that as an objective, so that makes it very difficult. Uh, again, context, as also has been said, is very essential. Uh, internationalization means something completely different for Harvard, a world-class and top-ranked institution, uh, and Boston College, which is only three miles away from each other. Uh, uh, a community college, again, is completely different with respect to its internationalization focus, uh, and they have all three completely different positions on the ranking. So, uh, that... Uh, is is the point that there, there are probably many more community colleges these days, and also uh, smaller uh, universities around the world that are much more international and that are much more uh, responsible uh, to society than the top universities are in many respects. So, look at the context and uh, see how you can improve the contribution that internationalization makes to equity, to inclusion, and to uh, the improvement for society in the broader sense, and also as a green uh, internationalization. It's not going to be easy, and the danger is, and we have seen that also in Glasgow, uh, people talk a lot, uh, have to make compromises, and then the real action is not that easy to be made. Uh, it is a responsibility that we move from words to action in all aspects on internationalization to make it much more equal and, uh, and inclusive um, to, uh, for societal impact and the greening, etc. We have to do that. We cannot just say uh, uh, we are sympathizing to that and not make any action. Uh, actually, the past two days, uh, Philip Albach, my predecessor and I, uh, because I'm staying in his basement uh, this week, uh, we have been trying to see can we really uh, come with a proposal how to make indeed uh, internationalization more uh, green. 
and there are several others who are doing that the the uh, coalition for action in in, uh, uh, in international education for for climate change is an important one the people in york uh, in canada are doing very important things uh, on that topic uh, we have to be much more action oriented to make our internationalization really much more inclusive and all the instruments that fernando has meant like coil etc are there so we have to uh, make the problem a solution we have to say well uh, we can reach much more people we can be much more uh, addressing global learning for all uh, we can have in webinars like this much more people interacting with this other than if we would have gone on a plane and then travel for two days to give a talk for one and a half hour and a Q&A of 15 minutes and then go back again to the other side of the ocean, uh, which is not socially responsible, is not effective and doesn't reach the number of people that we need to reach. So let's look into different ways how to internationalize to make it much more inclusive and to make it societally much more responsible. It is possible and by that then we improve the quality of what we are doing. And if that means that we rise up in rankings that others invent, that's fine, but that's not the starting point. The starting point is we have to be much more socially responsible as people working in international education and working in higher education in general. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. I really um, nice to, to get excited too and get urgent and angry you know about these issues um, hopefully with the the goal of pushing that momentum forward more and more actively the urgency couldn't be more real i think at this stage um gerardo a lot has been said across the panel here i wonder if there are any additional thoughts that you might have around this notion of equity focused internationalization and rankings Thank you, Laura. Uh, first of all, I will associate myself with all the remarks that my colleagues have made. I really think there have been some really important and valuable insights here. Um, the one thing that I would um, say in response to the question is that if there is anything that rankings have demonstrated so far is two, uh, twofold. One of them is that they can be responsive uh, to perceptions of the market, right? Uh, the second one is that they tend to proliferate. So certainly, I think there are ways to tweak and to adjust some of the approaches so that they can um, capture right um, inclusion uh, or uh, Jedi as the uh, very uh, important um, sort of acronym that uh, Fernando was sharing. I think the challenge with this is that uh, when we talk specifically about global rankings and inclusion, uh, then there is a very limited set of issues that we could be uh, comparing across, right? So for example, um, green internationalization, uh, climate change knows no boundaries and no borders. That's perfectly uh, one of these categories that can be captured and should be measured through rankings. There is no doubt about it. Uh, other forms of uh, inclusion become much more uh, complicated uh, and more um, and well less less likely to be captured by rankings because uh, when we have global uh, rankings or any kind of global exercise like this, we often fall in the trap of the lowest common denominator. So, for example. Um, then when we start talking about other forms of inclusion or rather of exclusion, we first need to understand the cultural differences. It becomes a lot more nuanced when we start talking about gender-based inclusion or when we talk about uh, forms of exclusion that exist only in particular contexts, right? Uh, like religious inclusion and exclusion, that becomes a lot more complicated. It becomes something that a global ranking simply is not uh, equipped to capture. And those, I would argue, are precisely within given societies, the kind of uh, more urgent um, issues of social inclusion that we need to be tackling, right? So, so it really, so it's important to, yes, push for, um, for rankings that are paying attention to some of the issues that we really care about because quality is at the end of the day a question of values. What do we value as a society and therefore we entrust that 
two universities uh, to preserve to enhance and to generate new knowledge to promote those set of values. Those values are, uh, well, only a few of them, I would say, are universally agreed. Um, and, and that's an important challenge, right? So in a way, I doubt that rankings will be the solution, but they can be less of a problem when we are trying to approach uh, issues of inclusion in internationalization. Uh, I would agree with my colleagues. There seems to be consensus in the panel, of course, that we should be making some of these fundamental commitments as universities and then let what happens with rankings be kind of a secondary thought. I think we all have pointed out two very important examples of how rankings leading policy development tends to be a misguided approach. Brilliant. Thank you, Gerardo. That really important reminder about the importance of values uh, leading the way and mechanisms following those. I think that's that's vital. Um, I'm going to bounce back to uh, Hans, if I may. In your introduction, Hans, I was mentioning that you're quite interested in post-pandemic internationalization possibilities and realities. We are all sitting here online. One could argue because we're environmentally conscious, but I think more uh, vital at the, at the moment is that we were prevented from traveling, many of us, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. It has had such profound ramifications across our lives and certainly in the work of internationalization. I'm curious to have a sense from each of you, and again, I will start with Hans, about the ways that these really current forces connected to the pandemic have been affecting how higher education institutions are thinking about their global profiles and with that, you know, potentially rankings performance. How do we see that playing out at the moment? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's indeed uh, an interesting and highly relevant uh, topic. The, the, the interesting thing is that we have learned two things from uh, the pandemic if we talk about internationalization and higher education. On the one hand, it is that students and even I think faculty and administrators uh, really have learned that they want to have a living community so that they have to be meeting each other in person, that inside the classroom and outside the classroom, that universities and colleges have an important role to play uh, in uh, well-being of the students and the faculty uh, to meet each other, to talk with each other, to have fun with each other, but also to learn from each other, etc. So that creates that we have to be mobile. That's uh, one thing. At the same time, uh, we have also learned that we can use technology uh, to be not mobile and still have an interaction by using uh, platforms like this one and Zoom, etc. Uh, to reach out to other people, uh, to talk with people, to interact with people. Uh, so uh, these two conflicting uh, messages have to be found in the right balance. Uh, we have to say, on the one hand, it is important that students have and faculty have this community. And at the same time, we have to try to avoid to go back to the old normal, which is not possible, but also uh, is, should absolutely not be uh, advocated for that we just move around the world as we did before. We really have to see, well, when we move, we have to make say, we have to say, well, this really makes sense. This makes sense from the individual case, from the institutional case, uh, from the specific needs that you have, but you always have to make a calculated decision what you are going to do. And a calculated decision for many of the things that we do I, we can do it online. So we have to improve that. As I said before, it is much more efficient that I have this meeting here than I would have to travel for two days uh, and to give the same talk. And of course, it is nice that after that I have uh, social contact with people, etc. So I'm not saying that is not useful, but we have to reduce that given the social uh, requirements that we have. So let's learn from the pandemic that we can make different choices than we have done in the past. That's, in my view, essential. Let's make each of us as individuals and as institutions deliberate choices to reduce our travel and only do it when we really think this is very important. And again, that can be 
different for a younger scholar that needs to have this contact uh, and for students than for me as a professor emeritus, uh, but still I also have to make that choices. I also have to make choices not to travel as much before. I have to make choices that I can reach out to much more people when I do it on Zoom or other platforms. That are important choices. So now when I receive an email for an invitation to go somewhere, and I can tell you I get invitations every day to go all over the world to talk, etc. I say no. I say I can do it online, but I'm not going to travel uh, for just giving one talk. And that's already an important decision. So I, for myself, I've made clear I will do only at maximum one trans, uh, uh, continental travel a year. And if I travel in uh, shorter distances, below the 1,000 kilometers, I will do it not by a plane, but I will do it by tr a train or other more environmental friendly things. That's I can do because we have the technology to do it differently. So let's make those kinds of responsible choices and not only talk nicely about how important it is that the world has to become green. That is my mission for the future. And that's what I've learned from the pandemic that we really can do that. Thank you. Hans, and I actually got a bit disconnected or frozen there for a moment. I hope I'm back online properly with you. Uh, but thank you so much yep. for those, those inputs. Fernando, I'd like to turn to you. You were already speaking about the, some of the lessons learned from the pandemic, the issues that have really come, surfaced in the process of navigating mm -hmm. this crisis. You're an institutional leader, um, and I'm very interested in, in getting your perspective on how your institution or, or peer institutions are thinking about glo your global profile, your place in the world, in this very new environment in which we're all having to operate. Mm -hmm. a, a couple of thoughts. One is just drawing, uh, and some of you might have heard it already, a message that Tom Friedman sent to us regarding the pandemic. He says, more people have communicated, collaborated, and competed in more ways, in more places, with more people than ever before. And I think that that's, that's very important. I think also that it's important to understand that the pandemic is not a storm. It's more like climate change. There are some fundamental changes that are going to occur. And this relates to the mode of delivery, how it is that institutions that have a specific mission are going to be able to carry out that mission using face-to-face, -face, using hybrid, using online, a combination of all of the above. And in the context of internationalization, uh, whether it is or not a priority, to what extent are you prepared to embed that into your long-range plan, change the mindset, change the culture, so that in fact, you are moving the needle not only in terms of what we have understood and have wanted internationalization to be, which is mobility, but something that is more comprehensive, that involves the whole university community, structures, processes. But uh, fundamental and key to this is how we impact the students. And as we move from what has been something that has been promoted as internationalization for some to internationalization for all, and in order to do that, we're going to have to be creative. We're going to have to accept that it doesn't have to be, as Hans was saying, not everything has to be face-to-face. -face. You don't have to travel all the time. You can use the curriculum. You can use technology. You can use internationalization at home. You can use COIL. You can use the notion of borderless professors to promote your own and to import those that you need without really promoting travel. So I think that we have an excellent opportunity here to uh, uh, lead the charge as, uh, institution, as institutional leaders, you know, as, as we are in uh, senior leadership positions, but also to embed that so that there is a change in mindset and culture and wh that whatever we do is not short lived, that it is long term and a fundamental change in terms of uh, internationalization. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Fernando. Um, Gerardo, I'd like to pass this question to you. You know, it occurs to me that in the current context, those student numbers, the quantifiable data that we talk about a lot with rankings and internationalization, 
those student numbers just aren't there, you know, for the obvious reasons. How do you see some of these, um, you know, dynamics playing out as rankings try to do their work to tell a story about internationalization when the pandemic is disrupting some of the key elements of that story? Yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, I think some of the examples that um, very often, um, um, very, very often, not only right the um, the difficult barriers are borders or even in this case the pandemic but sometimes the greatest obstacle for international collaboration is the perception of status what i'm uh, what i'm meaning uh, by this is that very often uh collaboration across borders tends to be aspirational, right? Uh, more, more and more institutions tend to look for uh, work together with institutions that are one or two tiers above, um, not only in terms of rankings, but also in terms of the strength of higher education systems and so forth. That is a very unfortunate dynamic. For example, institutions within regions do not want to collaborate with other higher education institutions in their regions because they aspire to collaborate with American or European higher education institutions. These are some significant challenges that, in fact, the pandemic has helped us uh, reset in a way. Right, because um, because when it doesn't involve travel, and by the, by and large, it doesn't involve a budget, we have a lot more freedom to decide as academics who we want to work with. And very often, the collaborations that have been forged during the pandemic have a stronger alignment of mission, a stronger alignment of values, and some of these barriers of status have been uh, de-emphasized quite a bit. Um, so I would say. Going forward, uh, it would be very important that rankings capture right, uh, some of these initiatives, right? For example, the number of courses that are being offered in uh, collaborative online uh, formats, uh, how many uh, students, particularly those who wouldn't have access to uh, physical mobility, are having access now to uh, virtual exchanges and so on, but also the things that we already were measuring before, right? The number of papers that uh, and grants and so on that involve uh, collaboration uh, of academics in different higher education institutions in different parts of the world. So I really think, um, like I said, rankings have by and large the ability to adapt, they are responsive. But I think as higher education institutions and particularly the elite students that actually have choice and that um, that truly use rankings for making decisions about uh, which national context or which higher education institutions they wish to access to, um, they could signal that. And I think that's one of the levers that we have for deeper transformation long term. Thank you very much, Gerardo. And coming full circle in our group, I wanted to turn to Daniela. Global profiles, institutional rankings, the COVID-19 era, what does all of that mean to you from your perspective? Yeah, so um, the global health crisis that was produced by COVID made it impossible, as we heard, um, in many cases for um, academics and students to travel and to become, to be mobile. And in fact, it went further than that. It made universities um, de facto isolated and remote, all of the universities of the world. And with this global uh, mobility on hold, uh, something that we could have never imagined uh, a few years ago. The wise words uh, from Don Quixote came to my mind, and I think they have never been more relevant for higher education internationalization, that uh, we should not put all our eggs in one basket. Um, and the hope is that, um, as we have heard from Fernando, um, Hans and Gerardo, that universities and governments have taken notice of this and are not going to return to business as usual once the pandemic is over. Um, and when the pandemic was declared in March 2020, Hans, uh, David and uh, Philip Adbach called the uh, COVID, the internationalization revolution that isn't. Uh, and one and a half years later, their expectation that the corona crisis would not bring about dramatic medium 
short-term transformations in higher education has mostly been confirmed. Um, governments and universities, um, most of them are just basically waiting it out. Uh, and in particularly with no more mobility, many institutions have relegated internationalization to an afterthought. Um, Yet I think the COVID-19 crisis is the perfect opportunity to rethink internationalization along the lines that um, all of the panel members have mentioned. Um, and in the absence of mobility to design activities and reconsider curricula to allow for internationalized education on the campus. Um, it is also the perfect crisis to think about increasing these virtual connections uh, when building international research project um, and really taking advantage of this possibility of reaching out to every part of the world. Um, I think um, the little um, initiatives we have seen around the world springing here and there are very important uh, as examples uh, and we should do this in a more uh, systematic uh, way and in an effort to contribute uh, to this um, with my uh, Ariane de Gaillardon, uh, we are suggesting to pay greater attention to internationalization strategies of universities that were isolated prior to the global health crisis. Um, so to look at uh, internationalization in isolation at places that are not the usual as, uh, suspects on our uh, list of universities uh, when we consider internationalization, but nevertheless um, are pursuing it and have had to be uh, creative in how they are doing because of their um, geographical or political uh, circumstances. Um, and I think this is, in a way, uh, responding to Gerardo's uh, call to not miss the opportunity to learn from new and innovative approaches to internationalization, to look um, beyond what uh, mobility and um, to make internationalization for all. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Your research project with Ariane, as you know, is very near and dear to my heart. It's an exciting, I think, opportunity to look at um, this story of isolation from a unique perspective and what we can all learn from it. Um, I also have to mention that Gerardo, Hans, and I have co-written a chapter that is coming out in Ellen Hazelcorn's new book on rankings, um, in which we start off by saying the evolution or the appearance of international and rankings on the global scene had occurred in, in succession. There was internationalization and then close on the heels of that in the contemporary era, this very new and um, dynamic focus on global institutional rankings. To me, it will be very interesting to see as internationalization responds to the COVID pandemic, if global rankings will, will also evolve and uh, take a look at internationalization through some, some different lenses. We have a couple of minutes left in our time in this session. I have been waiting to see if there might be um, some input from our audience, some questions or comments that might come there uh, from that direction. I have not yet seen any in the chat box on our side. So I was wondering if I might take a bit of um, prerogative as chair to push uh, one or two more questions your way that have occurred to me in this conversation. Um, the first has to do, um, and I'll pitch this to uh, Fernando, if I may. Um, as an institutional leader, I'm imagining that Within your own institutions, there are different perspectives from different constituents and, and stakeholders about the important rankings when it comes to your institution's internationalization strategy and, you know, quest for visibility on the global landscape. I was just curious if you might be able to uh, be willing to say a few words about how you navigate those different perspectives around the value and the place of rankings as a, an indicator of um, your institution's international profile. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and by the way, I'll have to disconnect briefly, but uh, thank, thank you for asking me right now. First of all, the institution embedded into its most recent long-range plan, a 10-year long-range plan, internationalization, it was one of the four pillars. Uh, second pillar, not in that order was quality. So we worked on accreditation, quality, internationalization with the faculty, programs, students, et cetera. And in the process, we began to involve ourselves in terms of rankings. So what we notice is that the rankings for our institution have been very important to the extent that we're moving from a teaching institution 
to an institution that wants to do more research. Rankings have been instrumental for us in terms of making sure that the needle in terms of research productivity is there and commensurate with what we do with respect to others. Uh, with respect to the culture, what we have uh, done is make sure that as we're constructing the long range plan, as we're constructing the KPIs, key performance indicators, as we are positioning project leaders, that these are academics uh, primarily who understand the issues, who embrace or are willing to uh, be open to these issues so that we can then work together and move forward in what would be an institutional effort. So while it might be a leader level instigated agenda, uh, there is the participation to make sure that we are uh, moving forward as a group. So I think empowerment is very important. Involvement is very important. A shared sense of uh, institutional priorities and direction is very important as you move forward and try to reconcile what would be internationalization as a priority and rankings as an instrument. It's not a means, it's, it's a means to an end. You, know, you want the institution to improve, but as a result of the improvement, maybe move up in your positioning. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that first person experience with those dynamics. I know that you may need to sign off before we officially finish at the top of the hour. So if that's the case, I would very much like to thank you for your contributions. It's been a wonderful thing to have your perspective here. Thank you. Give a couple of minutes. I'm going to squeak one more question in, if I may. Um, this one is, um, is it meant to be a little bit? Um, Gerardo, Hans, and I, and to a lesser extent, Daniela, have experienced working at an American institution, a U.S. institution, that has been uh, quite uh, remarkably disinterested, it seems, in, in global rankings. Um, this is not uh, on any one institution whatsoever, but to present a case of a particular institution, and, and Hans has mentioned this is not uncommon in the U.S. context anyway, to really not be quite so um, up about, you know, global rankings. Um, to, not to put too funny a play of words on it, but um, from your perspective, Sarajo, and is this a blessing or a curse, you know, to be um, working with an institution, thinking actively about internationalization, and knowing that the institution has a particular kind of disinterest in, in rankings? What does that mean in practice for trying to get a story out there? I'll let either one of you decide. Well, well, Hans, why don't you start? <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I think Hans should start. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's both a blessing and a curse uh, to a certain extent. A, a blessing in the sense uh, is that it is uh, not making them uh, driven by the rankings as indicators for the internationalization strategy. So that's 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 the positive side of it. So they can develop their strategy based on their own perceptions of values, uh, quality, uh, and what are the key priorities. The curse is uh, more broader than the rankings, is that uh, still uh, the perception of American higher education is that uh, we are a leading higher education sector, although there is a lot of diversity, as been said before, in the higher education system. Uh, but the perception still is we, we, we know best what we can do and uh, the global has to come to us and we don't have necessarily to go to the global. And if we go to the global, we do it on our terms and in our conditions. So in that sense, they are disconnected from the global uh, and uh, global rankings to a certain extent might help them, uh, maybe in a negative way, but still might help them to get a much more global perspective than they have. Uh, I think uh, uh, you mentioned Boston College. Boston College uh, is um, a university which is not uh, uh, extremely high in the rankings. It uh, depends on which criteria you know uh, you call. Because I mean, Boston College doesn't have engineering yet; they're just opening up to that, and doesn't have a medical school. So that makes them in the research-focused rankings uh, lower, where they're very strong in other disciplines which are not so much ranking-oriented, like um, social science and humanities. Uh, but so they they have uh, 
they didn't have a really strong international strategy. The Center for International Higher Education was a little bit of an island with other, some other research centers, uh, which were much more international, where the rest was not. But they have discovered that it is important to have a much more global uh, strategy. Now they have an, a vice provost for global engagement, and uh, they have a strategy for global engagement. They focus very much on their values and their mission as being a Jesuit university and a Catholic university to have a network of uh, being a, a participant in a network of Catholic research universities, uh, SACRO, uh, where they try to see how they can collaborate in that context. So. Uh, they, and that's not driven by rankings, because Catholic universities in general are not very high in the rankings. I think only the Catholic University of Leuven and, uh, uh, is, is, is really, really respectable in that sense. And so they don't have to worry about it, and they don't have that perspective. So you can develop your own strategy. So uh, both as a Boston College and in the U.S. context, I think uh, uh, it is good that they are not so much fascinated by rankings at the same time. It is bad that they have not that strong international orientation that they should have, uh, but it is developing. Thank you. Hans, anything to add to that? Add, uh, yeah, uh, just very briefly, uh, that I first of all agree. Uh, secondly, I would say the blessing, uh, the blessing and the curse in this case is that on the one hand, um, you could have not the attention on ranking. So we can understand rankings as a practice, but we can also understand rankings as the, not the, the practice itself, but sort of the values behind. And so that's where the curse comes in, right? Because very often the assumptions, um, sometimes incorrect about elitism, about exclusion in competition that fuel rankings could still be present even if rankings are pra as practice are, um, are not present. And I think sometimes that's uh, something that we struggle with, right, as we critically write and think about internationalization of higher education in our very own institution. At times, uh, you can say, well, we're not paying attention to rankings. That's a great thing. But sometimes the values um, and the assumptions that fuel rankings are still very much present and very much getting in the way of having more inclusive internationalization for all on our campus. Again, thank you for providing that institutional case. I think it makes things a little bit more real and tangible for all of us as we think about these dynamics. We are reaching the end of this session, and I would like to thank each one of you across our various time zones and uh, country positions for taking the time to be with us and to think through these really interesting and time questions. The notion of quality came up from the very beginning and I can't say um, enough about how I feel the quality conversation has been extremely high and really, really uh, educational. I hope our audience has felt the same way um, and that as we reach of the IREG 2021 conference, um, people are departing with a sense of new information, new ideas, new inspiration. Thank you again to each of you, and I will turn the program back over to our host. All good wishes. Thank you very much, Laura, for moderating this wonderful session. And thank you, uh, dear speakers, for sharing your expertise and most valuable ideas. This session was a true summing up of the conference, of the whole conference, IREC 2021 Cheddar Conference. Thank you, Laura, once again.